Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our My IBD Learning webinar series. Today's webinar will be focused on what it means to feel well with IBD. We're going to hear from some expert faculty as well as some IBD patients on the following key areas. We're going to identify different definitions of remission of IBD. We'll understand the role that shared decision making place, uh, takes place when we're selecting different treatment options. We're going to recognize the impact of IBD on mental health. We'll discuss some coping mechanisms and stress relief options. My name is Alyssa Strauss. I'm the Senior Manager of Adult Ed and Resources at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and I'm happy to be facilitating tonight's program. The My IBD Learning webinar series features different topics each month, and tonight is our last webinar for this year, but please stay tuned for more programming in the coming year. We encourage you to explore the webinar website to learn more about our monthly programs and read about our presenters. On the homepage, you can find different tabs. You can watch recordings of our previous webinars throughout the year. You can also connect to your local chapter or support group. To learn more about the platform, you can go to the navigation Q&A tab. If you have questions during the program, please visit the live discussion tab and a virtual help desk attendee will be able to assist you. Just a few housekeeping reminders before we begin. All of the presentations will be recorded and accessible to view after the completion of tonight's program. If you have questions for our presenters, and I hope you do, feel free to type them into the Q&A box at any time throughout the program. I'd like to start by thanking our event sponsors, Gilead Jansen, Takeda, and Bristol Myers Squibb for supporting the My IBD Learning webinar series. Their support enables the foundation to continue to provide important education for patients and caregivers. Now I'd like to start by introducing this evening's expert faculty who will be presenting. We have with us tonight, Dr. Tasif Ali. He's a consultant gastroenterologist and IBD specialist at SSM Health St. Anthony Hospital in Oklahoma. He's clinical faculty at the University of Oklahoma and adjunct faculty at Oklahoma State University. 
He's an active member of our Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, our patient ed committee. Uh, he's also a member of the American Gastroenterology Association and the American College of Gastroenterology. I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. Rachel Lawton. She's a child psychologist at Cincinnati Children's, specializing in the assessment and treatment of at-risk youth and their families. She works at the interface of child health and child trauma and seeks to identify and implement novel, accessible, and family-centered behavioral health interventions to address complex needs of families struggling with significant medical and social adversity. She also is an IBD patient, and she's been an advocate for the community for more than 15 years. Thank you, Dr. Ali and Dr. Lawton for being here with us tonight. I'm gonna to now pass it over to Dr. Ali, who will get us started with uh, helping us understand how to achieve and maintain IBD remission. Okay, great. Um, let me share my screen real quick, and then uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's an exciting event that uh, we are presenting our uh, one of the last series for 2021. Um, and um, I really enjoyed my IBD learning for myself and my patients have also learned a lot through these series. So I really encourage you to log on and get the previous episodes also. A lot of learning. Um, what we are going to discuss today and I'm going to present to you today is... Um, things about remission. What is a remission and how do we achieve and how do we maintain a remission? So in the next 20 minutes, we will be defining remission. We will be understanding the different types of remission. How do we achieve remission? How do we monitor and how do we maintain a remission? So let's start with this mysterious word remission. What is remission? You probably heard this a statement from your physicians, from the providers, caregivers um, about your disease being in remission. Um, the word remission comes from the cancer um, care when we talk about remission of a cancer. Uh, basically, it means decrease or disappearance of signs and symptoms of cancer. When we talk about partial remission, uh, some but not all signs and symptoms of cancers have disappeared. And we talk about complete remission. Uh, the cancer doctors, when they use the word complete remission, it means all signs and symptoms of cancers have disappeared, although the cancer may still be present in the body. When you look at the dictionary, the word remission means a period where a serious illness uh, when the patient, a period during a serious illness, when patient's health improves, or in another word, a state or a period during which the symptoms of a disease are suppressed. What does it mean in IBD? In IBD or inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, it means resolution of your active IBD symptoms. And what are some of the common symptoms uh, that patients with IBD present. It's diarrhea, urgency, blood in stool, abdominal pain, fever, weight loss, and fatigue. So yes, some patients do present with only symptoms of fever, weight loss, and fatigue, while the most common symptoms are related to your gastrointestinal tract, such as diarrhea, urgency, and blood in stool. And resolution of these symptoms Patients saying that my diarrhea has improved, my pain has improved, my symptoms have improved, that's called remission. That's different from response to a therapy, which means that my symptoms are better, are improved with an intervention, with therapy, but I may still be having some symptoms. But remission means that my symptoms have resolved. Now, let's look at the different types of remission. The one that I just described is called clinical remission clinically, you are having improvement in your symptoms. But then there are other types of remission also, such as biochemical remission, endoscopic remission, and radiologic remission. And we will go into a little bit of more details into each type of these remissions. When we talk about clinical remission, clinical remission means absence of active symptoms. We take it to another one step forward 
where we talk about steroid-free clinical remission, which means that now you're not having any symptoms without any support or use of steroids. Sometimes patients are given prednisone or other forms of steroids and their symptoms improved. So here your steroids are improving your symptoms. What we really want for our patients is a remission that is steroid free because we all acknowledge the short-term and long-term negative side effects of steroids. And we don't want our patients to feel better on steroids for long-term. Could be a nice bridge, but we ultimately want our patients to feel better, to have improvement of their symptoms without steroids. And that's called steroid-free remission. So that's one of the remission that we try to achieve in our practices is steroid-free remission. Then comes biochemical remission. Biochemical remission means that the values of blood tests and stool tests are normalizing, which indirectly then suggesting that your inflammation is improving or resolving. There are different markers in the blood and in the stool studies that indicate inflammation. For example, a simple blood test, which is called complete blood count, where your white blood cells or platelet counts may be elevated, and they're suggesting that there may be an inflammation still present inside your intestinal tract. C-reactive protein and ESR are some other common blood tests that we use in our practices to monitor inflammation. Then there are other tests like iron ferritin level that also indirectly can tell us that there is still inflammation that is interfering the absorption of iron or causing low ferritin level. Among stool studies, we have stool leukocytes, which is stool white blood cells, and stool calprotectin, which is another test that check for proteins in your stools that become elevated when you have inflammation, especially in your large intestine. When these tests are elevated, they indicate that you may be having inflammation inside your gut. And when these tests improve, they also show that there is improvement in the inflammation. So not only we are now looking for improvement in symptoms, but we are also looking improvement in markers of these inflammation that is driving all these symptoms. Then there is another concept called radiologic remission. You may have had your doctor, your physician, or provider order CT scan, x-rays, ultrasounds, MRI to monitor your disease. These tests also help us determine whether there is improvement where the thickness of the intestinal wall is improving. And then there are other uh, signs that we look on the CAT scan and MRI to see if there is improvement. Some patients who have Crohn's disease may suffer from fistulas or strictures, which are narrowings in your small intestine. And when we do CAT scans or MRIs, we can look if there is an improvement in these complications or complicating Crohn's disease manifestations. Recently, we are also learning another useful bedside tool called abdominal ultrasound. And it's called small intestinal abdominal ultrasound. In Europe, a lot of practices are using this bedside technique to look for inflammation improvement, especially in patients with Crohn's disease. We are learning this tool in the United States also, so that one day we can adopt this in our practices. Lastly, I'll talk to you about endoscopic remission. So endoscopic remission means improvement and the signs of inflammation that you see during endoscopy. When you go to your gastroenterologist or a physician who has performed your endoscopy, you know that most of the time they will give you a report that you have inflammation, you have colitis, there is redness, swelling, or ulcers inside your intestine that are showing inflammation. And the reason we put you on medication is to have improvement in that inflammation so that your symptoms are improved and your complications are reduced. Then there is another entity called histologic remission, 
You may recall if you have ever had a colonoscopy done and if you have inflammatory bowel disease yourself or your loved ones, you will see that physicians will be explaining to you that they have done biopsies so they can look under the microscope and see the degree of inflammation. When that degree of inflammation is improved, that's called histologic remission, which means that microscopically under the microscope, the inflammation is getting better. You can see here on your left side that I have shown you four different pictures of a colon. Number A is your normal colon. B is you're getting slight inflammation. C, you're getting more. And D, you are getting the severe inflammation. And when we talk about endoscopic remission, what we mean that this inflammation is now reversed and we are going back from D to A level. Similarly, histologic remission, as we discussed, it means improvement in the inflammation at microscopic level. You can see here on the left side, a normal colon picture. It is a cartoon of a normal colon when you look under the microscope and the box is showing you actually what we see under the microscope. On the left side of this left cartoon, you are seeing a box that is showing you a normal colon. And then in ulcerative colitis or any type of colitis, you are seeing that this normalcy is gone. Those, these deep pockets and the normal surface of the colon is distorted. Now you're seeing this branching here, this distortion of the colon, and then under the microscope also, there is kind of like a war zone going on. A lot of white blood cells are coming there and damaging the wall of your intestines. And that is called inflammation, active inflammation. And one of the goals would be to improve that and bring you to a histologic remission meaning normalization of all these white blood cells that are infiltrating in the wall of your intestine, having them re get reduced and improving the structure, the microscopic structure of your colon, and that is called deep histologic remission. And why is this important? This is important because inflammatory bowel disease is a progressive disease. You can see here in this cartoon that at the time of the disease, initial diagnosis happens, then you get early uh, disease. And with time, you get these a roller coaster ride where you can get flare, you can get um, remission, you get improvement in your symptoms, then you get another flare, and then you get improvement in the symptoms. And you can see that over a course of time, this happens. And we give medications to you so that you can have improvement. One other important concept to learn is that as the time passes, the risk of complication and the disease progression at structural level progress, and that can then lead to complications such as surgeries. So the total disability index, meaning the bowel damage, occurs over a period of time. At a given period of time, you may be in remission then you may have a period of relapse where your symptoms are back and you're getting medications and now you're going back into remission. So you're seeing this longitudinal course of the disease. But we also need to appreciate that the bowel damage accumulate over a period of time. And there may come a time when the medical therapy may not be able to save or reverse this bowel damage. So the goal of our therapy is to prevent that and bring all these graphs all the way down as much as possible and as early as possible. So how do we achieve that? Should we focus on clinical remission? Should we focus on improvement in the endoscopy? Or should we focus on microscopic level of improvement? And why this is even important? So there was a study done about 10 years ago that showed that patients who are in clinical remission meaning they're coming to the study and telling us that they don't have any symptoms. They don't have diarrhea. They don't have abdominal pain. Out of those patients, about 60 to 70% of the patients were still inflamed. And that's very important because this persistent inflammation can cause complications. An improvement in inflammation 
or the healing of the bowel leads to better outcomes, such as reduction in hospitalization, prevention of surgeries, and even prevention of cancer. We know that persistent inflammation can lead to cancer development. And it can also help us prevent inappropriate escalation of immunosuppressive therapy. Now, I understand this is a very complicated and busy slide, but I want you to understand the concept of healing. So once you heal at a deeper level, you, write, you reap the benefit out of it also. If you look at, on the left side, patients who have no healing, but they're just feeling fine, versus patients who have healing endoscopically, and patients who have healing at the deepest level, all the layers are now normal. You see the steroid-free clinical remission. At one year, the chances are higher in patients who have achieved deeper remission. Same thing true on the right side, where you're seeing that their chances of relapse are also very low, 60% versus 4%. So that's very significant. And I think nobody wants to have relapse and everyone wants to minimize their chances of relapse. And that can happen if we try to achieve deep remission. So what are the targets that we are trying to achieve in Crohn's disease? Where do we take this? Where do we take this knowledge and apply in clinical practice? The way I do, I explain to my patients that we have two targets, clinical remission, and endoscopic remission. Clinical remission in Crohn's disease means resolution of the abdominal pain, normalization of your bowel habits. That all improves the quality of life. But we also want to prevent complications. So we want the resolution of the ulcers. We also want to see if there is improvement radiologically on CAT scans or MRI, if there is inflammation of your small intestine to make sure that not only you are feeling better, but the disease is also getting better. In ulcerative colitis, similarly, we want resolution of the bleeding, resolution of your diarrhea, but we also want improvement endoscopically. And that's why your physician may want to do some tests to make sure that not only you're feeling better, but actually there is improvement in the inflammation. And this is also important because we have to understand the concept, our new understanding that symptoms and inflammation don't correlate very well with each other. You can be completely asymptomatic and may still be inflamed. And I shared one study with you where the significant portion of patients were still having inflammation. On the other hand, patients may not have any inflammation and they may still be having symptoms. And those symptoms may be derived from some other factors. They may have superimposed IBS. They may have structural damage, although their colon has healed, but it has led to some permanent damage that is now causing them to have symptoms. So that also brings up the concept of not only treating and improving the inflammation, but doing this as early as possible. So now in the last few slides, I will share with you some of the recent recommendations that experts have put together when we are taking care of our IBD patients. One such recommendation comes from STRIDE guidelines. What it is telling us that our short-term targets being symptomatic response, we want to make sure that our patients are feeling better so they can carry out their daily activities, improve their quality of life, but we also want to make sure that their markers of inflammation are better, such as normalization of CRP and other blood tests. But then we also want to have some intermediate targets. That later on, we want them to have their calprotectin, which was the stool study to get better. And if this is a child, we want them to start having a normal growth pattern. And then the long-term targets, such as we want them to have endoscopic healing, we want them to prevent any disability or complication. So the management of IBD includes some therapeutic strategies. When you're talking to your physician, you are assessing the risk of the medical therapy, you're assessing the risk of not getting treated or uncontrolled inflammation. You're also defining and designing 
your therapy plan so that you can make sure that you are on an effective therapy, on an effective dose to control inflammation. Then you monitor that. You make sure that you are going into a clinical remission. You are going undergoing an endoscopic remission and the markers of inflammation are improving. That all will lead to improved outcomes. And that brings the concept of treat to target. And this is not a new concept. We have taken care of, we have seen, we have lived with our loved one, family members, friends who have high blood pressure, diabetes, um, and other arthritis. And you see that how their doctors are controlling not only the symptoms, but also some markers. The blood pressure patient, high blood pressure patient, the doctors want their blood pressure to be in a certain range. Um, The diabetic patient wants his hemoglobin A1C to be under certain target. So it's not a new concept, but it is a newer concept in IBD. So we have to define a target and then we have to work as a team to achieve that target. And that leads to shared decision-making that prevents your doctor going north and you're going south because at the end that can cause damage and harm. So in order to have shared decision-making, you need to understand these concepts of remission, treat to target, so that you can have better outcomes. So today, what we learn that achieving remission is an important part of IBD management, but defining remission target is also very important. Not only just having clinical improvement, symptoms improvement, but also having some more objective markers to ensure that inflammation is actually healing so that your risk of complications from structural damage, surgery, and cancer is reduced. So steroid-free remission, improvement in inflammation leads to better outcomes. And that can only happen if we do a shared decision-making and we all understand what we are trying to achieve here. With that, I'm going to end my presentation and we will have question and answer sessions at the end. Thank you very much for having me tonight. And now I'm going to pass on to Dr. Lawton to help us understand mental health and how do we manage that in IBD. Thank you so much. That was um, a fantastic presentation. Um, I am going to share my screen. Just give me one second. Okay. Um, So my name is Rachel Lawton. I am a, a child psychologist at Cincinnati Children's. Um, My uh, single disclosure is that I have IBD myself. Um, I was diagnosed with Crohn's um, in uh, 2001 and um, have had a lot of the same experiences that many of you all have probably had also. Um, So we're going to talk about emotional factors in IBD health. Um, And I think the first logical place that we start, um, is why is this topic important? Why is it worth carving out some time on a Thursday night to chat about? Um, ideally we can say that emotional health impacts physical health. And I think that, um, all of us who've had, you know, a run with the flu or, um, a cold definitely know that we feel, you know, a little bit under the weather emotionally when we feel poor physically also, Um, But I actually think that this um, downplays that relationship. Um, Instead of emotional health impacting physical health, what we actually know now based on research is that emotional health is physical health Um, and that the two um, uh, are really joined and linked in a way that makes one outcome really dependent on the other. Um, The way I describe this to families is uh, that we want to think about the body and the brain as having a highway that goes between them. Um, They're always talking, always in communication, and that highway runs in both directions. So how we feel impacts, how we feel emotionally impacts how our body feels physically and how our body feels physically impacts how we feel emotionally. Um, This bi-directional relationship can be really hard uh, because it means that there are multiple uh, reasons and factors that contribute to how we're feeling overall. 
Um, on the other hand, it gives us a lot of avenues and potential targets for treatment. Um, it means that uh, we can change how our body feels if we're feeling um, poorly emotionally, and we can target our emotional health if we're feeling poor physically, and we know that that relationship is going to be reciprocal. Um, the last piece is that IBD is really hard. Uh, we know this based on decades of research and more so just clinical experience, anecdotal experience talking with families. Um, research suggests that there are four core reasons that contribute to the emotional symptoms, particularly depression and anxiety that are seen among IBD patients. So the first is impact of disease. Um, we know that it, it, the impact of disease is multifactorial and can really extend from your close personal relationships within your home to within your community, to school, work. Uh, the impact is really unmeasurable in many ways um, and, uh, again, goes back and forth. Um, treatment. Treatment can also be really challenging. Um, we've been so fortunate over the last you know, 10, 15 years to benefit from biologics. So there have been huge gains in that regard, um, but they're not perfect. Uh, and even when medication is working perfectly, it's financially draining often. It requires a significant amount of upkeep. Um, you have to take off work if you're getting infusions. Um, it's definitely not a low key uh, treatment protocol. And so it definitely contributes, contributes or has the potential to contribute uh, to overall emotional health. The third one is intimacy. Um, we know that uh, IBD impacts everything about our lives, uh, not only physical intimacy, but also emotional intimacy. Are you willing to share with those people in your life, um, both romantic and otherwise, um, the things that are really difficult? I think one of the things about IBD, and this will go into the fourth one, is that um, it could be really challenging to share information about symptoms. It's one thing to tell someone, oh, I have a migraine. Um, there's nothing potentially shameful about that. Um, but it's another thing to share with a friend, oh, I've been having bloody diarrhea all day. Um, that takes a different level of um, communication and comfort and trust. Um, and that's because of this stigma associated with it. Um, one of the common things we hear is uh, that people don't want to be judged. They don't want um, people to assume that they're complaining or that they're making a big deal out of something that's really small. And they don't want their symptoms to be misunderstood. Um, I have a lot of families and patients share that you know, they're really frustrated when people say, oh, I've had a stomach ache before, or I have a friend that has IBS. Um, and really, it creates these, these barriers um, that definitely contribute to a sense of isolation, anxiety, um, and symptoms of depression. Um, so we know it's important. We know that emotional health impacts physical health and vice versa. Why do we need to talk about it now? Um, we know that many, if not the majority of IBD patients who experience distress actually don't talk about it. Um, and many physicians do not ask. So the data behind this is sort of startling. So while 50% of, of participants reported significant distress associated with their IBD diagnosis, only 15% of those participants were engaged in therapy. So there's a huge percentage of patients who are really having a difficult time and also not in active treatment to help manage that. I think the other critical part here is only 16% of patients were asked about their emotional well being by their IBD physician or nurse. And I think that this is a barrier that we're confronting in many different ways right now. Um, I think the concept of integrated care, where we have a social worker, a psychologist, a mental health professional embedded in GI clinics, that's definitely new and it's building. And there's models for that across the country, but it's definitely not the norm right now. Um, and helping uh, medical teams uh, become comfortable with and savvy at asking these questions and um, having a plan in place. So what do you do if a patient says, yeah, I am struggling right now. I'm really sad, or I'm really anxious. I can't leave the house. We want to make sure that patients are comfortable bringing that to their medical providers and that medical providers feel confident and comfortable, um, helping patients, uh, reach out for services and get connected to mental health professionals. So the two 
big emotional concerns that we hear, there are many, but the, the two primary concerns are depression and anxiety. So we're going to go through a little bit about both um, and then talk a little bit about what treatment options look like. So depression is more than just feeling sad. Um, common symptoms include low mood, irritability and anger. Um, and I, I should have bolded and underlined that anger part um, because actually that's what we see more on our uh, child and adolescent end. Children and adolescents generally actually don't appear uh, sad in the way that adults do. They typically appear very irritable um, and often angry. Um, ambivalence. The common thing we hear is I really just don't care anymore. And that might be, I don't really care about my health. I don't care about taking my medication. I don't care about coming to work or doing a good job. Um, low motivation. I can't really get out of bed. Isolation. I just want to stay in bed, watch Netflix, um, not engage with my friends, family, things like that. And the hard part is obviously there's a lot of overlap here with an IBD flare. Um, and so, you know, how do you distinguish the two if they're co-occurring, which we know again, that link between emotional health and physical health is really strong. Anhedonia or a fancy way of saying nothing is fun anymore. Um, you know, I, I often ask families, are things that used to be fun still fun? Do you enjoy doing them? Um, if things aren't fun and they used to be, that's a problem. Um, and we want, we want to talk with you about it. Difficulty focusing and concentrating, changes in sleep and appetite. Again, that brain body link is strong. And then thoughts of suicide and thoughts of self-harm. Um, symptoms of depression and depression diagnoses are startlingly common, uh, among our IBD patients. So we know that up, a, up, of a, up to a quarter of adult patients have symptoms of depression. Um, and we know that patients, uh, with Crohn's and or active disease are actually more at risk. Uh, symptoms, um, are present in 15% of IBD pa pediatric patients and 3% of those patients meet criteria for a depressive disorder. Um, so that's a lot of kids that are feeling pretty sad. Um, Anxiety. So just as depression is more than feeling sad, anxiety is more than feeling worried. All of us feel worried sometimes, uh, particularly now um, going on year three of a global pandemic. Um, I can tell you that anxiety is running quite high. Um, common symptoms include frequent or excessive worry. Um, in our kid language, we call these sticky thoughts. So are you having thoughts that are coming in worries that are coming in? And even if you don't want to think about them, do they hang around? Are they sticky? Do they get stuck? Do you have a hard time controlling them? Intrusive thoughts or images that result in distress. And these actually can often be IBD related. If you're having worries about, um, your health or your illness, or you've just come out of the hospital, it might be that you're having those images of the hospitalization sort of flash through your mind. Physical symptoms, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, headaches, muscle, muscle tension, and then changes in sleep and appetite, um, really reinforcing this idea that the, the brain and body is linked and it can be really hard to um, separate and differentiate between the two. Anxiety is super common um, among the population at large, but particularly among patients with IBD. So research suggests among adult patients that IBD um, patients are uh, about two to five times higher than the global averages in terms of endorsing uh, rates of anxiety. And similar to uh, depression, patients with Crohn's or active disease are more at risk. And so um, we often partner with our physician colleagues and try to proactively seek out patients who we feel like might be at risk um, and try to work with them beforehand uh, to make sure that they feel supported. Symptoms of anxiety are very common in our pediatric patients. Up to a third of patients have symptoms and about 4% meet criteria for an anxiety disorder. And I would say that actually these percentages are, are very likely an underestimation. We know um, just based on research that uh, when you go into a doctor's office and you're asked to uh, disclose mental health symptoms, most people will underestimate. Um, and so the, the rates of these are probably actually much higher than, than the data suggests. So mental health interventions, participation in therapy has a really broad evidence base and is demonstrated to be highly effective. We know it works and we know it works really well. So if it's so effective, 
Why do so many people suffer in silence and avoid talking with their medical providers about their concerns? Um, most people understandably find the idea of therapy awkward, uncomfortable, and embarrassing. Um, and that is true across the board from the five-year-olds to the 65-year-olds that we have. Um, people find the idea of sharing um, vulnerabilities uh, really challenging and really awkward at times. Um, the positive thing is therapy is not what we imagine it to be. So I ask most families to tell me what they imagine therapy is like. And I, I get a very um, sort of a old school, a vintage answer um, that, that thinks of, you know, lying on a couch, talking about your dreams. And the reality is that's very different than what therapy is like um, these days and what it's been like for the last several decades. So therapy is actually a conversation. Um, that's all. It does feel a little awkward at first and it can feel embarrassing, um, but it's, it's a muscle that you learn to flex and it becomes more comfortable the more you use it. Uh, there are a range of mental health interventions um, that have been uh, established um, through lots of research as uh, not only solid treatments for general mental health concerns, but particularly beneficial for uh, patients with IBD. So the mainstay gold standard is gonna be cognitive and behavioral therapy. So the goal for CBT is that we wanna challenge thoughts and feelings of unpleasant emotion. Um, again, this is the gold standard evidence-based treatment for depression, anxiety, and trauma. Uh, and there are decades of research that support its efficacy. Um, CBT is based on the notion that emotional symptoms impact the way we think, the way our body feels and our behavior. We can't make people be um, happy and we can't make them feel calm and not anxious. Um, if we could, I wouldn't have a job anymore because no one would choose to feel this way. Um, but we can become more aware of how we think. We can become more aware of how our body feels and our behavior and we can change some of those things. Uh, therapy is time limited, eight to 12 weeks, and it's skill based. Um, we're not talking about dreams. It's not going on for years and years and years unless we need to. Um, a newer kind of approach for therapy is called acceptance and commitment therapy, also called ACT. And the goal is to learn how to tolerate unpleasant emotions. So we're not making it go away, we're learning how to tolerate it. It's considered the new kid on the block for evidence based treatment. And it's based off of the idea that when we act in ways that are consistent with our values, our psychological symptoms will decrease. This is also time limited and very skill based. We have hypnosis or hypnotherapy. Um, there's really strong evidence for managing discomfort and pain associated with IBD. This also extends to IBS for those patients that may have both. Um, gut directed hypnosis focuses, focuses on um, really utilizing relaxation to foster decreased gut hypersensitivity, improve gut motility or how the gut moves, increasing the patient's sense of control over symptoms and management. And again, therapy is time limited and you're going to be practicing between sessions. And then mindfulness. So mindfulness is actually a concept that's incorporated into um, a huge host of different therapeutic approaches, including CBT ACT and hypnotherapy. And mindfulness-based therapies, again, use relaxation and meditation to foster awareness and acceptance in an open, observational, and most importantly, non-judgmental way. And evidence suggests that mindfulness-based therapy improves quality of life and reduces depression among patients with IBD. So we're going to go through a mindfulness-based exercise in just a second, um, but I wanted to give a brief overview first. So the exercise is going to provide an introduction to um, what we call diaph diaphragmatic breathing, um, or with our, with our kids, we call it belly breathing. Um, and we think about this as the on-off switch. So remember that connection between the brain and the belly. Um, if we can breathe in this really special way, we can really flip that switch and switch the body's nervous system and put it on a relaxation um, loop instead of a heightened, anxious, concerned, um, very vigilant um, loop. And, and that can be really helpful in um, not only feeling, helping the body feel relaxed, but helping um, our brain feel relaxed as well. Um, I am going to... Um, stop sharing my screen for a second.
and then share a different one. So this is about five minutes. Um, and it's gonna go in through a brief introduction um, and uh, then the exercise. Hello, it's Eve here. Welcome to this short mindful breathing exercise for those moments where you feel overwhelmed by stress. So let's begin by taking a big deep breath in through the nose and then out through the mouth. Just to help settle us into this exercise. There is a lot about life that can cause us to feel stressed, and very often that list is long. And if you're feeling particularly stressed right now, I'm sorry. For the next few minutes, let's try to set that list aside if we can. So in this exercise, we're going to do a very simple breathing exercise together. Deep breathing helps to send a signal to the brain that we are okay. It activates the calming centers of the body, which helps to create some space, a space in which we can choose to respond to our stress in a more skillful way. Often taking a moment before we react to stressful situations can make all the difference. So getting comfortable wherever you are sitting, taking a moment to feel the contact of your body on the chair or the surface beneath you, that sense of your body being held and supported, the feet on the floor. And you can close your eyes if that feels right for you or just adopting a soft downward gaze. So first, bringing the attention to the breath. Noticing where you feel it, perhaps in the nose, the throat, the chest, or the diaphragm. And we're going to be taking some deep breaths in through the nose for four, holding it for four, and then breathing out the mouth for six. And with the out breath, you can even let out a sigh, or so that it's loud enough that you can hear the breath. So let's begin. Taking a big deep breath in for four, two, three, four. Hold it for four, two, three, four. Now breathing out the mouth for six, two, three, four, five, six. That's great. So deep breath in for four, two, three, four. And holding it for four, two, three, four. And breathing out for six, two, three, four, five, six. One more time, deep breath, in for four, two, three, four. Holding for four, two, three, four. And then out for six, two, three, four, five, six. One final deep breath, in for four, two, three, four. Holding for four, two, three, Four, and out for six, two, three, four, five, six. That is great. Thank you for doing that with me. So gently allowing your breathing to return to its natural rate and rhythm. You did really great. So connecting in with the different points of contact in the body, the feet on the floor, the back pressing against the chair, the hands in the lap. Opening the eyes if you had them closed and taking in the whole space that you're in. 
making note of all the different physical objects, perhaps taking in what is outside as well, if you can see out of a window. So this is an exercise you can come back to any time you're feeling overwhelmed. We can breathe into the stress together. Thank you for joining me. So that was a example of um, a very brief five minute mindfulness based um, exercise uh, that really tries to capitalize on the power of uh, belly breathing and deep breathing um, as a way to control not only how our body feels, but how, uh, how we feel emotionally as well. Um, that is the extent of uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you guys. I'm going to pass it over to, um, to Alyssa. Thank you so much, Dr. Lawton. We appreciated that talk and that uh, mindfulness exercise. Dr. Ali, thank you so much for explaining um, all those different types of remission in a very easy and understandable way. Um, I'm excited now to share um, with you two patients, two IBD patients who are here to share with you their personal journey in navigating their physical and emotional health with IBD. And then after they speak, all of our presenters will be available to answer questions during the Q&A. So just as a reminder, please submit any questions you have for any of our presenters uh, through the Q&A box, and we will try to get to as many as possible. So I'd first like, um, we're first gonna hear from Danny Goldberg, and then we're gonna hear from Mackenzie. So I'm gonna pass it over to Danny to introduce himself. Thank you very much, Alyssa, and thank you to the foundation for, uh, for having me today. Uh, my name is Danny Goldberg, and I'm a patient with ulcerative colitis. Um, I'm also a third-year law student. I was diagnosed uh, my sophomore year of college in 2016 um, via a colonoscopy. My initial diagnosis was Crohn's disease, but that diagnosis was changed to ulcerative colitis about a year later. I've been on a variety of medications over the course of my disease journey. Um, but to kind of cope with, uh, with having the disease while being in college, I was very open and honest with my professors, um, registered with the disability center so that if I had a flare or if, uh, I needed to schedule an infusion, uh, my professors were pretty understanding. So when I got to law school, I was in remission. I'm doing really well going on a bunch of hikes. I go to law school in an area where uh, there's a lot of pretty hikes. Um, started in remission, but I lost response to my medication shortly thereafter. And I ended up being hospitalized three times um, during my second year and, and actually took finals in the hospital as well. Um, and I, I luckily tried a bunch of different medications and uh, was able to find one that worked. So in order to uh, get to remission or, or live a healthy life, I've kind of I've kind of adapted um, a holistic approach to my health. And what that kind of entails is I, I go on these daily long walks. I speak to a GI psychologist. She's at my, um, one of my, she's a part of one of the health teams that I see. Um, and so I participated in, in hypnosis therapy in CBT therapy and ACT therapy. And it's all been extremely helpful. So I'm a huge proponent for therapy. I've gone to um, different nutritionists to kind of understand like the different studies and facts around what may or may not be helpful um, for an ulcerative colitis uh, diet. And then I've also like developed a lot of trust with my, with my different health teams. And so when I'm talking to my doctors, it's definitely a conversation. It's not really the doctors telling me, here's what you have to do. It's a conversation between me as the patient and them as the provider, just so I can understand all my different options. Um, and then personally, I try to educate myself as much as possible um, so that when I go to my doctor's appointments or have my therapy sessions, you know, I have things to talk about and, and I'm not just kind of being talked to. I get to talk with my different providers. So again, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'd like to pass it off to Mackenzie. Thank you so much, Daniel, for um, passing the mic and sharing your story. And I'd like to thank the foundation for having me here tonight. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Mackenzie Hood. 
Um, I'm currently a junior in college and I'm the co-chair of the Foundation's National Council of College Leaders. And I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was 14 in back in 2015. And it took me quite a few years to kind of figure out what feeling well looked like in my body. And because I was diagnosed in high school at such a young age, all I wanted was to fit in. And I really struggled to accept my diagnosis and myself. And I lived in complete denial for a very long time. And all I wanted to do was be normal. And it took me a long time to figure out how to kind of find my own normal. Um, in addition to like the emotional battles that I struggled with, um, for a few of those years, I dealt with unbearable pain every day, despite being in clinical remission. And during that time, I learned how to become an advocate for myself. And I knew that my pain was legitimate and it can be very hard fighting pushback, um, but it was so important to do so and learn how to become an advocate for myself in a constructive and timely manner, because I know my body and I know the type of quality of life I deserved. And I found it important to begin taking charge of my health around my later teen years. And it not only helped me cope with my disease because I felt like I was in control of my IBD, IBD and had a say in my healthcare decisions, but it also helped prepare me for my transition to adult care from pediatric and to prepare for leaving for college where I wouldn't have my parents to help support and advocate me, advocate for me in person. Um, around the same time, I began to prioritize my mental and emotional health. Um, I regularly go to therapy where I've learned how to cope with my diagnosis and accept myself for who I am. I've worked a lot on self-empowerment and self-esteem, as that's something I've really struggled with as a result of my IBD. And there are so many other mental struggles that I've dealt with, but having my therapist by my side has been amazing because having somebody who's not really part of your personal circle to help guide you through um, life and help provide you with ways to manage your feelings is so beneficial and I couldn't recommend it more. And it's helped me change my attitude towards IBD, whereas before I was in complete denial and now I'm very involved in the foundation, very involved in IBD education and advocacy. And by prior prioritizing my mental health, I've seen my physical health improve as well. And I do have to say that the best thing I found for my emotional health is finding community. And by joining the NCCL, I have found a group of 20 other college students who have been there to support me throughout my journey. And by finding people within the IBD community who can support you, um, they'll help you get through your day-to-day -day struggles because they can relate to you and understand and by falling back on your um, family and friends. So that's a little bit about my um, journey, but I want to pass it back to Alyssa and thank you for letting me share my story with you. Thanks so much, Danny and Mackenzie for sharing. Um, just a brief snapshot of your stories. Um, we're so happy you could be here today. I'm gonna now uh, have everyone, all of our presenters come back on screen. Um, we're gonna take questions from the audience. So please, uh, just a reminder, submit your questions through the Q&A box and we will get to them as soon as possible. So let's uh, start with a few that we've received. Um, I'm gonna first ask Dr. Ali. Um, uh, there's a patient that submitted a question. Um, it's a Crohn's disease patient who had surgery um, affecting the small bowel and the patient's on biologics, but has not had a scope or imaging test as a follow-up in two years. So the patient's asking which radiological or lab tests are best um, at this point in his or her journey. I think this is a, a very good question. Great question regarding follow-up after surgery in Crohn's disease. Um, I think uh, one quick answer is that um, the treatment for IBD, Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis, not a cookie cutter that one management plan 
would be applicable to everyone. So that's why you really need to have a very open discussion about the concepts of follow-up, plans, medical therapy with your uh, treating physician. In general, depending on which part of your small intestine was removed and how the anastomosis was done, if it is accessible, it can be looked through a colonoscopy, then most of the experts would recommend that if you have high risk features before surgery, such as you were recently diagnosed, you were younger age at the time of diagnosis, you have other risk factors, um, you might need to be followed up fairly soon after the surgery to make sure the disease is not recurring. Um, Alternatively, uh, at some point, you do need to be uh, monitored through a colonoscopy or some other test to see that the disease is not recurring. And if at the time or at the point of recurrence, you need to be on therapy. Uh, the situation becomes tricky if you have intestinal resection, which is at the part of your small intestine that cannot be reached through the scope. Then there are other tests available, such as capsule endoscopy, CT scan, and MRI. I think what would be the best test for you really depends on the comfort level, the resources available, the expertise available. We can suggest one test for you, but if you don't even have the resource, the, the, competent, uh, the competency, and the expertise to do that test, that test may not give you a better yield. So having these discussions with your physician and say, whether I need a capsule endoscopy, whether I need a CT scan or MRI, and what type of findings we would be expecting, and how do we then address those findings would be a great discussion to have with your physician. But in general, I think the best tool is just have a plan with your physician. How do we monitor it? It can be anything. It can be a CT enterography. It could be an MRI enterography. It could be a capsule test, or it can be a simple blood test to begin with, and then you can make plans subsequently. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Dr. Ali. So now we have a question that's for both Dr. Ali and Dr. Lawton, and I, I'm gonna ask also our, our patients to weigh in if they experience this. So this person's asking that um, they're told that causes of flares can be multifactorial and that stress can initiate a flare. Is that true? I'm curious if you know, also our patients have experienced that as well. So I'll turn it over to maybe Dr. Lawton first and, and everyone can weigh in. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, I'm so glad that we have Dr. Ali here um, because tag teaming for these questions is so important. Um, so our perspective on the role of stress is um, really based on the idea that stress impacts our body biologically. So we know that stress changes um, a lot of different things biologically and neurochemically in our body. Uh, but also that our behavior changes when we're stressed. Um, and uh, from a mental health and emotional health standpoint, the way that we think about the relationship between stress and flaring um, is typically related to how our behaviors change when we're feeling really stressed. So generally speaking, when we're stressed, when we're feeling really anxious, uh, we are uh, we have fewer resources available to take care of ourselves. So, um, our sleep might change, our diet and eating might change. Um, we may be less likely to remember to take our medication. We may exercise less often. And while those things um, likely by themselves aren't going to push someone into a flare, um, if they're vulnerable because of other biological reasons, um, not taking your medication and then eating foods that you know are not going to make you feel good, and then being really anxious, which is going to increase your cortisol and prime you for being maybe at risk of a flare could absolutely push you over. And so as a psychologist, we always focus on, you know, the way that emotions change our behavior and our thoughts and feelings. And so it, it's absolutely possible that stress is going to change the way you take care of yourself in a way that makes it more likely uh, that a flare might happen if you're vulnerable to that. Yeah, and I would completely agree uh, with Dr. Lawton's statements. So I think uh, the very first thing is the fact, how do you define and what actually stress is for that particular patient? 
they may be calling anxiety, depression, or some other um, um, issue as, 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 as a stress, maybe a simple word to put their problems as I'm stressed. And that could be a lot of factors that could be a, the, the definition of stress could be, it can in, encompass a lot of things, physical, emotional, mental, lots of stress. So the first thing is what, what the patient is asking as a stress. And then the second thing is that yes, stress can, the, the brief answer that I give to my patient is that yes, I'm not dismissing the fact that stress can lead to a flare, but there may be a different way to handle that flare than a regular giving you a steroid or giving you a, a different treatment plan. Maybe we need to address that differently, uh, but, but yes, um, we have to be aware of that fact. We know that certain patients feel uh, stressed um, in different ways, like they get a little bit depressed or maybe have a little bit of emotional um, instability when the season change. And I think that's, uh, and, and then they, they get stressed and they, they come to us and say that, hey, we know what, what time of the year we are having a flare or when we feel that our body is getting under stress. And um, so I think that, 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 that there is a relationship there, uh, but very complex and complicated relationship. But that's where you need to have a very good healthcare team that is involved so that we can address, tease out these triggers and address those triggers. Thank you. Danny and Mackenzie, did you have anything you wanted to share as far as how maybe stress impacts you or cause your players Has that, if you've experienced that before? Uh, Mackenzie, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so I've noticed there was in the pre in the past year, um, I had kind of a different type of stressor for me. It was a living situation, um, away at college and I didn't have the best roommate situation. And that put me in a very uncomfortable, unsupported, um, environment, which ultimately affected my IBD because I was, you know, doing probably the best I had been doing health wise. Um, and then I found myself back into daily pain, um, having to miss classes because I wasn't able to leave the bathroom. Um, after the semester ended, I went back to my GI, had a colonoscopy, found that I was not in remission anymore, um, had to change up my medications. Um, and within a few months of being back home and out of that living situation, um, my health had kind of taken a complete 180. Um, so I think that's kind of an example of when um, I had experienced stress, not necessarily like the kind of stress you'd think about with like school or work, but like my environment in which I like lived in um, affecting me and negatively affecting my health. So that's kind of an example where I've experienced that. Um, and I don't know if you want to share anything else, Danny. Yeah, I would just quickly say, obviously, I can't talk about the biological stuff like Dr. Ali, but anecdotally, um, I've experienced stress just with like graduate school. And I think there was a definite, definite correlation between law school finals and then my flare up. Um, so I think there, there's got to be something there. There must be. I would totally second that just anecdotally finals would come along in college and grad school and like clockwork, my labs would tank and I would wind up pretty sick when I got home for break. And yeah, it's, I think a lot of patients will report similar things and it, there there's, it, it's complex and hard and complicated and healthcare teams are um, fabulous in that regard when they include a lot of different people who can help in a lot of different ways. Um, one other comment that I would just add is an, another kind of like an angle or twist to the stress is the frustration. Sometimes many patients who are newly diagnosed or even established patients, they get frustrated because of lack of communication skills about describing their problems, describing their issues. And they get really frustrated and stressed out by the fact that their doctor, their physician, their healthcare team is not understanding what they're trying to explain, the reason they are not wanting a therapy, the reason they are not wanting to have a surgery done, because there could be a lot of personal issues, personal factors, financial factors, social factors that may be impacting their decision about what to pursue. And they may not be very open. They may not know how to describe those um, frustrated moments in their life. 
So one suggestion that I always give to my patient is to write it down and send it to me later. Um, we have now, most of us use electronic health records and they have my chart or patient portal where they can actually write on a little mini diary before their actual visit. And I get to review those and prepare myself also as a physician to have better discussions with my patients when we are well prepared ahead of time. Or maybe we are talking about these offline at a certain later time when it is more convenient and conducive to have uh, these type of conversations that may be adding stress and causing a little bit of mis, not a little bit, sometimes a lot of mismanagement that may be occurring because you are not on the same page with your healthcare team just because of that. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. I'm going to move on to another question, Dr. Ali. I think this is more for you. So the question is, why can extra intestinal magnifications still occur when you're in remission? And we're referring to maybe, you know, joint pain, fatigue, body aches. So again, a very good question. Uh, we, or at least I try to explain to the patient that Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are not just limited to the gut. These are systemic inflammatory diseases. They, they begin with the inflammation, but that inflammation um, in a simple word, spill over your entire body and can cause a lot of extra intestinal manifestations and sometimes they are hard to control. So that's one spectrum. The other spectrum is that you may be having concomitant other autoimmune or other immune mediated or other inflammatory problems associated with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. A lot of patients who have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis have psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, spondyloarthropathies, which means that inflammation in your back, back uh, spine and uh, eye problems, um, skin problems that are associated with IBD, so that you have that spectrum that may need to be independently addressed. And then the extra intestinal manifestations may also be um, addressed independently than your actual treatment plan for IBD. And then the last portion is that you may be having manifestation as a complication of Crohn's and colitis. You may be having a vitamin deficiency that is causing problems. You may be having a mineral deficiency or some other nutrient deficiency that is causing you to have extra intestinal problem. Maybe that's why your joints are hurting because you're getting osteoporosis because your vitamin D is low because you've been on steroid for such a long time. Uh, so there are a lot of things, a lot of factors that go in, and we have to address that, and we have to understand that why you're still having extra intestinal manifestations or all these other body aches or skin problems. Um, and one important thing is fatigue. And there are lectures and there are a lot of information about fatigue and IBD, which is a very complex role. It could be related to the inflammation itself. It could be related to uh, uh, psychosocial uh, issues. It could be related to nutrient deficiencies, iron deficiency, for example. So a lot of factors. So it takes a village to take care of an IBD patient. So it's a whole team. Um, so that's why it's very important to get your care at, um, at a place where you have these resources available to you, uh, where you have expertise available to you so that you can get all these issues addressed um, effectively. There was actually a follow-up question I wanted to add onto this one. The patient was asking about persistent IBD fatigue in remission. And I know you just talked about it. Obviously, we need to identify the cause of it. But I guess, you know, I maybe like to ask also Dr. Lawton or even the patients if they experience um, fatigue and perhaps how they cope. Um, I'll just briefly start and then I'll hand over to other, other experts and our patients to throw a light because that's a very interesting, fascinating for me as a physician when I put my science and medicine hat. Uh, about this fatigue, very intriguing. Uh, why do patients complain of fatigue and tired, uh, tiredness? 
what is it that either they are labeling that as a fatigue and tiredness? Is that like a mental fatigue? Is that actually a physical fatigue? Uh, what do they actually mean when they say, I'm tired, I'm fatigued? Um, sometimes when they are seeing us in clinic, um, we don't have that much time uh, to, to explore that. Uh, and that's where our other experts come into play and tease out that. But in general, uh, we know that the, the inflammation itself can have its toll. We also know that certain medications can cause fatigue as a side effect. And then we also know that certain nutrient deficiencies can cause fatigue. So I think we just, as a physician, when I'm addressing fatigue, I try to address it from different angles and perspectives from the medicine point of view. And I think now I'll ref defer to Dr. Lawton if she has more expert opinion and insight to this phenomenon. Fatigue is really hard. I, I feel like it's a horse of a different color. And um, I think that the thing that we tend to get worried about from a mental health end is um, at what point does the fatigue become uh, a symptom of a mental health concern uh, rather than something related to physical health? Um, Fatigue is super common in depression and it's actually pretty common in anxiety too. Um, and that relates to a lot of different factors. Um, one of the big ones is that um, for both depression and anxiety, uh, sleep is typically quite affected. Um, so it can be hard to get to sleep. Um, quality of sleep changes. Um, people wake up early or they wake up multiple times throughout the night. And so they're at that quality of their sleep is actually significantly poor. So most people will say they wake up not refreshed. Um, the other piece we know is that um, particularly with depression, the behaviors that are associated with depression, um, like isolation, withdrawal, uh, poor motivation, difficulty engaging with friends, with social relationships, those kinds of things can actually perpetuate that feeling of fatigue also. Um, that, I mean, all of us have had a time when we've been a little tired and we go and sit on the couch and you fall asleep. <laughs> um, and so uh, what happens is we start to get ourselves in this cycle where we might feel tired um, and we might be a little sad. And so we might make a choice to stay inside by ourselves and go out with our friends. Um, and that sort of sets in place a cycle um, where that fatigue maybe was there initially, but then it gets exacerbated by the behavioral factors that are associated with it. Um, the problem is then we might feel really tired and we might attribute that to our disease. Um, and it, it creates a, a cycle that can be really hard to get out of by ourselves. Um, so I absolutely, it's a complex issue. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking with, uh, physicians and oftentimes actually nutritionists also, if there's concern for, um, any type, type of dietary changes that might be helpful or iron, um, as well. Danny or Mackenzie, I'm just curious, not to put you on the spot. Have either of you experienced this kind of symptom? And if so, how have you tried to combat it or, or cope with it? Um, yes, I've experienced fatigue. Uh, and I think a lot, a lot of it was attributed to what Dr. Lawton was talking about, which was like overall quality of sleep post hospitalization. My quality of sleep was not great. Um, and I think that really contributed to a lot of fatigue and just as far as coping with it, I found that actually like physical activity really helped me with fatigue. Um, as far as like going on walks or, or just trying to get out, I felt like that really helped. I have to um, second Danny. I've also struggled a lot with fatigue. Um, and I've also found that exercise and like um, staying active can really help it as well as making sure that I'm getting um, my full amount of sleep and kind of finding the quality of sleep um, that Dr. Lawton talked about. Um, so yeah, I definitely back up everything they said. And, and it's something I'm always trying to find better ways to manage my fatigue as well. 
you guys sort of shine the light on our exact, uh, one of our first, uh, treatment options, which is get getting people active and outside. Um, so it seems counterintuitive, but, um, behavioral activation, getting active, um, actually can not only jumpstart our mood, but, um, is really important when it comes to being able to sleep well. Thank you. I'm going to actually go back to Danny McKenzie. So we had someone asked a question about any suggestions. I know McKenzie, you're in college and Danny, you're at, in law school right now. So there was actually a question about um, navigating college with IBD or living far from home. If you have any suggestions that you could share um, with our audience, they'd be very appreciative. Mackenzie, go. go okay, ahead. I'll start. Um, so I think one of my best suggestions is finding a community. Um, and right now, especially with the pandemic and everything that's happening, one of the best ways is to find um, a virtual community. Um, so whether the, you find one that's like a social media page or um, an online support group that maybe meets weekly through your university um, there are lots of ways to find communities, whether it's through the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, they have um, a link to find support groups near you, or through your university's um, like organization list. Um, I know some universities have IBD support groups, um, and also a great way if they don't have one, I know a lot of universities allow you to start your own. Um, and so that can be a great way to meet other students who have IBD. Um, and you can even include caregivers because they're just as much part of the picture as the patients themselves. Um, and there's um, ways to get involved with your local chapter. Um, so the foundation has many chapters across the country where you can get involved and participate in events that will help, you know, raise awareness for IBD and allow you to get involved. And I found that like getting involved more really helps me cope with my disease and kind of accept that this is part of my life. Um, and so that's kind of my best suggestion. If you can't find a support group on your campus, um, start your own and like reach out. It can be very scary to reach out to people, um, especially like regarding IBD, but at the, in the end of the day, it's very rewarding um, to find that community of people who understand and accept um, your journey. So I don't know if Danny, you have anything else you wanna add? I, I would just say, um, be as open and honest about what you're experiencing with the people that you can trust. Um, as much as you feel comfortable. So like with me, when I was in college, I was diagnosed in college and my friends kind of went along the journey with me through my diagnosis and my first flare and such. And so they were kind of beginning to understand the disease with me. Um, and so that was kind of helpful, but I, I tend to just be very open and honest with, with anybody who will listen just so, um, you know, hopefully some of us can feel more comfortable uh, when we're faced with uh, having to talk about this disease with other people. Thank Can you. I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, so one other um, great resource for being a college student is getting in contact with your Student Disability Resource Center. It can go by many different names, you know, uh, across campuses. But I think that's so important to get reg registered as soon as possible because you never know when like a flare may happen. Um, so it's important to be proactive in that. Um, and your um, the person at the office, they'll be able to guide you through any conflicts you may have, whether it's with a professor, with other students. So I think having those connections early on is really important. And that's been super helpful with me because I have had conflicts where I had to have a surgery and a professor was not being the most understanding of that, but having my disability coordinator in place and my plan of accommodations allowed me to have a much smoother ride than what it could have been. Um, so that's another one of my college recommendations for IBD. Thank you. That was super helpful. Uh, Dr. Lawton, there has been um, some questions in the chat about finding a GI psychologist. And I know you mentioned that this is, I don't want to say an emerging area, but that many centers are trying to bring in all those pieces into play. So do you have any suggestions. I know we've been referencing the Rome Foundation as a tool to search, especially if there's not one maybe in your 
immediate area, if you have any suggestions, because there are concerns that maybe therapists don't actually understand UC or IBD. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's a fantastic question. And um, there is a shortage of mental health providers in general right now, just based on need. Um, So the Rome Foundation is definitely a great place to start. Um, If there's anybody that understands the relationship between the brain and the gut, that it would be those psychologists. Um, In general, we often direct um, families to first talk with their doctor um, and ask about uh, psychologists, social workers, counselors, who they have established relationships with. Um, Ideally, um, you can see someone who is connected with your practice so that that psychologist, that social worker would be able to talk with your doctor. Um, that's a luxury I think that, um, is again, building, um, but, uh, a lot of, um, healthcare centers don't have that yet. Um, but typically, even if there's not someone as part of the clinic, uh, those providers should have, uh, names, contact information for referral options. Um, the other option that actually often feels better because people can be active and it's something they can control um, is going to a central database like um, Psychology Today and searching under specific um, subject lines. So we would want to we would want you to search for a provider that had a background in CBT or ACT typically and that had um, a experience working with um, people with chronic illness and you can actually type in specific um, search cues And so you would want to search for GI illnesses or GI psychologists. Um, The other thing you can do is uh, contact any of the major academic medical centers that are in your area. Um, And they typically have a stronger referral base for either psychologists, social workers in their healthcare center or within the community at large. Um, But yeah, GI psychologists, neurogastroenterology um, is uh, what's often searched for with regard to the Rome Foundation. Um, All of those are great options, but the core set of skills is actually that CBT, that act with a focus on chronic illness. Um, So if someone has that framework and they're working from that theoretical perspective, they may not know how the nuances of IBD, um, but they would be able to um, help you in terms of symptom management, coping, chronic pain, chronic illness. Thank you so much. I think we're just about at time uh, at this point. If we did not get to your question, we recommend that you reach out to our IBD Help Center. Um, it's available uh, through one 888 gut pain and that you can call them and ask them any questions you need or info at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org. So at that point of the evening, I want to thank all of our panelists and our presenters for sharing your knowledge and sharing your journeys and answering questions. I want to remind everyone to please uh, complete our evaluation survey, excuse me, that will be available uh, for tonight's program. We really do appreciate your feedback and it helps us plan for future programs. We'd also like to invite you to look at your local chapter's upcoming events on our foundation website or their social media page. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors, Gilead, Takeda, Jansen, and Bristol Myers Squibb for their support. Thank you again for joining us and have a great evening. Happy holidays.